Great. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. On behalf of the National Child Passenger Safety Board, thank you so much for joining us today for the CEU webinar, Backseat Blitz, featuring outgoing National Child Passenger Safety Board member, Denise Donaldson. I am Tammy Franks. I am the curriculum representative on the National Child Passenger Safety Board, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. We've planned time uh, to answer your questions at the end of the presentation, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box. I'm joined also by Claudia Summers, who will be monitoring the Q&A box uh, in the background, and she will be uh, uh, forwarding your questions uh, to be answered at the end of the presentation. As a reminder, uh, if you are joining this webinar today, uh, please do not operate a motor vehicle by doing so. We ask that you wait to watch the webinar recording that will be posted to carseateducation.org in approximately one to two business days. Uh, additionally, this presentation qualifies for one CEU and in order to uh, earn the CEU on this for this webinar, uh, attendance is required for at least 45 minutes. Proof of attendance will be emailed out 24 hours after this webinar. So again, that will be emailed out tomorrow, 24 hours after the webinar. So please join me in welcoming Denise. Denise, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, Denise Donaldson here from Safe Ride News Publications. So hopefully you know me from the Safe Ride News newsletter as well as the Latch Manual and School Bus Safety Handbook and some other publications that we produce. I also run a local program in, here in the Seattle area uh, that is called Car Safe Kids. And I've been doing that since the mid nineties. Uh, I've been a CPST instructor since 98. And like Tammy said, I am ju I've just rolled off the board ending my three year term. So uh, looking at, as we were preparing for this, I was looking at the title Backseat Blitz and it might have, I thought to myself, oh, maybe that's not super clear what it's about, but this is going to be about new trends in child passenger safety as far from the vehicle side of things. So looking at what we consider common features today and reviewing specific situations and perhaps some tips on how to use those, uh, use child, uh, use car seats in those kinds of vehicles. And then of course, I always like to provide resources that can help you in your job. So the reason I developed this particular presentation was uh, I was kind of inspired from um, annual visits to the Seattle Auto Show. So Katrina Rose, who some of you may know, she works with me on the latch manual. Uh, she and I go every year to the auto show in the fall at um, in Seattle. And um, you can see 2016 kind of a scene of the auto show, lots of cars. Of course, we had that little blip in 2020 and we didn't have a show back to 2022. More re most recently, it looks much the same, but there are some differences there, uh, whereas frequently there were had been uh, about 400 cars to look at. We are building back up since then uh, and maybe now around 300, but still quite a bit few cars to see. Uh, and the, uh, while in the past we always saw the next model year in that fall timeframe for the show in Seattle. Uh, we've noticed since the uh, pandemic, we are getting current model years and the next model year that supply chain issues have affected even their ability to get the newest cars to the show. So we're always having to check what we're actually looking at because it really makes a difference uh, between remodels, what, what's really new and what's um, uh, what, what is maybe something that's on that going out. But overall, in general, we've kind of noticed over the years some basic trends. And so Katrina and I were saying, well, maybe a webinar about those trends would be great. So, you know, when we go to the auto show, sometimes there are fun things for us to do there. Uh, some local celebrities, we can see things that make it a little more memorable, but most of the time it's strictly business. So we have our tools, uh, mostly unsophisticated ones, but we take lots of pictures and we try to get perspective, like in this case, checking with a pen how high that um, that um, uh, asymmetry in that seatbelt system is. You know, we got tape majors, of course, here you can see Katrina outside a car getting ready to fill out our paperwork. And here's my hand, you know, a very sophisticated tool trying to give an assessment of how far away that seatbelt fits to me. But you can kind of see in the background on the on the seat there is we have a, a, a spreadsheet that we fill out for each one of the cars that 
we mark various things. And over time, we start to realize that the things we're marking all the time instead of varying have changed so that we um, really see certain things have completely evolved. And when we see things that we think, oh, this is interesting for you all to look at, we like to take pictures and put them in what, in our Safe Ride News Latch Gallery. So this is our first resource that I'm going to note. This is what the homepage on a computer looks like, uh, where you'd go to saferidenews.com and then under Latch, um, and even on the lower quick links, you can find Latch Gallery. And then some of those really unusual things in cars revolving around Latch are going to be noted in PDF so you can see thumbnails here. And it works pretty well. I'm really pleased it works really well on your phone too, because on the phone is where you're going to be car site. So you can really utilize these helpful pictures worth a thousand words kind of things car site as well. And so you'd go up on your phone to this hamburger menu and um, the listing is going to show latch gallery and you're going to have the same options and you'll see the same little thumbnails so that uh, car site you can add to the information that you might get. So in the latch manual under the notes, it'll even direct you, hey, check out this latch gallery. There's something for you there for that model vehicle. And I also want to note um, about the latch gallery is that it's really supposed to be a tool for all of us to use together. Uh, so if you see something out in the field and you thought, well, this was so stranger, I'd really like to show this, you know, in pictures to someone, but darn, it's not in the latch manual. Well, by all means, take pictures. We have a submission form where you can upload those photos and give us a little more info and we'll get it onto the latch gallery so we can all be helping each other with some of those unusual things. So as we go through this presentation, I'm going to show you some slides from the latch gallery that's going to support what I'm talking about. Basically, um, last year you might have seen a webinar I did called uh, Oldies But Goodies, and that kind of bookends this one. So we were talking, you know, we're looking before we had in older vehicles, we, we know we're not going to have in the very much older vehicles, we're not going to have lower anchors. Uh, and then uh, not even tether anchors until those were required in 2000. And when they did come in, we saw a lot of variety in where those anchors might be. So you might remember that uh, picture from the curriculum, which shows all the different potential anchor locations kind of drawing off the back of one car seat. And that was very valid in back in the day. Um, and then there are a lot of things about seat belts that were different. They lacked lockability um, before 1996. And uh, of course, until around the mid 2000s, we didn't have lap and shoulder belts in the center. And fr frequently the anchor hardware was uh, either really long on webbing or maybe even a stiff buckle stock would be normal. And we had some things that were forward mounted. So we had things that we were dealing with a lot over time. And that really has completely transformed in today's vehicles. Uh, now, of course, as we know, all the vehicles for a very long time have met FMVSS 225. So they all have what we'd expect for latch and they have to meet the minimum standards and some even go a little beyond. And as I was alluding to earlier, all of those varieties in where anchor tether anchors might be has really kind of calmed down, I would say. Uh, of course, back then and today, if it's a sedan, it's been on the back shelf uh, or a filler panel. Um, but in all those other kinds of vehicles, we see it on the seat back more often. I'm going to be showing you some pictures of what I'm talking about there. And then about um, the seat belts, um, not only are there lap and shoulder belts in the center, back when lockability came about, of course, that's a performance standard, not a design standard. And so the vehicles could come up with a, any way they wanted to meet the standard. And so we typically saw a fairly even uh, option of using uh, a, a switchable retractor versus a locking latch plate. Nowadays, almost it's extremely rare to see a uh, locking latch plate. All, even the ones that used to use them regularly have switched over to switchable retractors. So we see that almost these days as, as a norm. It's not standardized, but it is something is fairly uniform. Also, because people are using latch now and there's more um, sophistication in how the, the buckles and belt systems are designed to protect adult occupants, we see a lot of variation in the buckles that's pretty common that I'll talk about more as we go through. But before I go into some of those details, uh, I want to go over a little bit of some of the basics that Katrina and I use when we're going through the auto show and things that maybe seem like um, maybe a little bit 
common sense, but but I just wanted to say them out loud so that we really all understand. First of all, uh, CPS aspects of a vehicle aren't going to change until there's an overall design change, right? So from year to year, I would expect at the auto show, I'm going to see the same thing until the, the vehicle is redesigned. Uh, and that's not going to happen. In, it's a roughly a five-year, four or five-year um, flow for vehicles to be redesigned. Um, um, and that being said, even after a redesign year, there may be no changes as far as the back seat goes. The whole vehicle might look different or it might have minor changes, major changes, but it doesn't always mean there are changes to the back seat. And so uh, that's one reason in the latch manual why you'll see some really wide ranges of, of years listed in the model listings is because while that vehicle certainly has had refreshes going on, the basics for latch have stayed the same unless there are some details in the model notes. Also important, especially in auto show, but in general, is to note that there are differences in the trim feet that can affect child passenger safety. So just saying that I saw this vehicle and this model in this model year doesn't tell me everything I need to know about um, how a car seat might work in there because the actual trim or variations of the vehicle seating can make a difference as well. And often at an auto show, you're going to see those top end types. Um, so it does matter to kind of to know that as well. Um, also, in current days, model year designations aren't as predictable as they were in the past. It used to be 10, 20 years ago. And of course, for decades prior to that, it was a very exciting time in September because the new cars were coming out. And you'd see, I remember seeing the spotlights in the sky and like, what's going on? Oh, the dealership is having their big announcement of the new models for the next year, which would come out in September of the prior year. Nowadays, you don't see that much specification. It can come, a model year can be designated for the next year much, much earlier in the year, and you can have a mid-year change. So it really varies. The thing to know is for, it's the date of manufacture that's going to matter when it comes to what federal motor vehicle safety standards are need to be met. Because like I showed on the prior slide, a lot of the things that's driven the changes that we're seeing in this presentation have to do with regulations that have changed and that ultimately our fleet has caught up with those changes. And so you really need to kind of know the model year. And so one really good way to find that is to be paying attention to what's on the um, VIN placard or door jam label. Um, and those are gonna be either here on the door itself or down here on the, the door jam. And so I'll take just a moment to talk about that a little bit as well because uh, I'm not sure we all are utilizing as much as we should. And so this picture just showing the way we, we usually have to cock our head a little bit to see it. But if we turn it right side up, you can see it's going to tell us the VIN, which is a nice place to find that easy to see. Um, also, of course, the maker, the type of vehicle. But helpful for us to know, of course, here is going to be the date of manufacture. Okay. And then also the gross, gross vehicle weight rating is kind of useful as well, because like you'll remember, um, from FMVSS 225, it only applies to vehicles, uh, to, to uh, passenger vehicles up to 8,500 pounds gross vehicle weight. And so there are some passenger vehicles that exceed that a bit. So that's another helpful thing to be able to look at and see, well, why am I seeing something a little different when it comes to what I expect from regulations in a vehicle? Well, maybe it's a heavy vehicle that's falling outside of those requirements. So like I mentioned, that date of manufacture is really helpful to know because then you'll know what regulations based on when those regulations took effect. And I'm just showing this one over here because while this is a different vehicle, it looks very different than the label here. There isn't really a layout requirement, but the elements must all be there. So this label might not look exactly like this, but you'll find all the required elements in place, okay? So now I want to move into, I'm going to go through lower anchors, we're going to go through tether anchors, and then um, seat belts, and then we'll follow up with some miscellaneous at the end, okay? So as far as tether anchors go, I would love to say that this picture is showing you, this is a pretty new model year Honda HRV, and it's a very nice example of very wide open lower anchors. They have label, they have the little button markers, as well as being very obvious. And I have to love that this is an opening above the bar because we always want to put the, the hook, um, the heavy end of a hook or push on over the top of the bar. And, and I'm sure you all can relate. 
Um, sometimes you have those points where you just say, bless their hearts. They tried to make an opening, but sometimes they put the opening under the bar and it abuts the bar. And that still, unfortunately, is the case in some, some cars. So um, while this is a nice one that shows something that would be very easy other than moving some of this hard buckle hardware out of the way, uh, it's nice to see that uh, you can get in. And there are some vehicles like that, but by and large, they're still a lot of cases uh, where it's deep down in the bite and not that easy to find. What I want to talk a little more about is uh, now is some situations that we see more often nowadays where the vehicle seating has uh, what's called a waterfall or Tootsie Roll, which is basically this little extra padding that sits over what would technically be the bite where the seat cushion abuts the seat back. And so you have Katrina and I years ago when we started seeing these more, we would kind of refer to the seam here, which in many cases is a seam. Sometimes it's sewn and it's not a seam, but when there is an opening there, we would, we would refer to that as a high bite because it's the opening and sometimes the lower anchors would be in there and it would be a little bit higher than the seat edge seat cushion that is. And so that would make a difference for us, right? Especially with rigid latch, how you get it attached. But what I wanna point out in the next few slides is just for finding these bars in the first place, because while it's tempting to get sticking your finger into the bite and looking around for it, especially when you see uh, the button right here, the first thing to think of and what, you know, technically what we're taught, go down to the bite and start sticking your finger in. But as you can see in these pictures, in this case, uh, you have to know, I'd already pulled this one out so you can kind of see, but when it comes from the factory, it looks very solid. But in fact, if you stick your hand back in there and pull very hard, this is a solid piece of Velcro, but you have to, so you have to pull very hard on it, which is a little bit weird feeling when you're in someone's nice new car, but um, rip that thing open and you will find that that is where your anchors are. So rather than digging around in the bite, which would be very difficult to use, you have a very easy and open access. Here's another one in a 2022 Lexus SUV. And similarly, you're gonna have a button that's kind of letting you know where to look and you have a bite area here that you might think of as a bite. And you even have an opening here, which you could start digging around looking for the latch in there. But in general, when you have these high bites, um, and be looking for, the way that you might be able to access it more easily. In this case, you again need to pull back that panel. And this one has an extra step, which is you might be all familiar with this kind of carpeting that goes, or I don't know, it's not carpeting, it's um, it's a, a little fabric panel that has it can be scored, uh, as it is in this case where I've taken the um, my fingers pointing to where I've pushed through and kind of basically ripped where it was scored so that it will access those lower anchors. So you're gonna have two steps to go through. Um, and so here um, is the 2021 Honda CRV, which in the NDCF we're finding is the most popular vehicle people are using for their kids, at least the ones that come in for car seat checks. So very popular vehicle. So do you think the lower anchors are in the bite? <laughs> and so, yes, but kind of no, right? So if we took what we normally do and go from the button down to this bite, uh, it's a little bit of a higher bite, um, but I've already kind of started picking my finger in there and you can start to see the opening that's on the sides, right? So it's not straight down. You wanna go through to, these, to this uh, slit on the side and then you can really um, fairly easily just by prying those parts apart, access that. And so, this is it. This is a page from that latch gallery that's kind of showing you that um, this vehicle image was taken in 2021. And I mentioned here, it's likely going to apply because there was no re there was uh, these are going to be uh, groupings of where the back seat was similar 2017 to 2022. You're likely to see this situation. And um, I like to. Um, as much as possible, put the page from the owner's manual in there, because you might be thinking to yourself, well, why don't we just check the owner's manual, which of course, absolutely do. But as you'll see, you're, um, they're constantly improving owner's manuals, but you're not always going to find all of the information you'd really like to find. So in this case, they are telling you where the lower anchors are. They aren't necessarily telling you this one is one that has uh, a second, a center option. So there's a shared bar uh, that you'd use um, to, to make a center uh, situation as well. Um, so it tells you where those bars are. It doesn't tell you which ones to use together necessarily. And it also just says 
uh, you are going to find it under the button. And so uh, this is trying to help help you with a little more uh, hint as to where it'll be. And here's just a couple other examples where you might find a, a fairly high bite, but here's a zipper op opening. And here's one that's really um, kind of slick where it's just a plain fabric um, overlap with one another. So one side, you just peel back and you peel back the other, and you can just get your fingers in there and open it up. So there are lots of different variations of this, but when you find yourself, especially in a high bite, digging around and finding it really difficult to go down into it, Subarus have had for years this kind of thing where you pull the, the part back. It's a similar kind of thing. There's a much easier way to get there. Unfortunately, it's not in every manual described exactly how to get there. So um, check the latch gallery. Um, if you see something, go ahead and, and submit it. So moving on to tether anchors, uh, happy news, as I kind of referred to before, most are moving to the seat back uh, when it's not a sedan and on the back filler panel. And that is great for us because the more uniform these are, uh, the better. And these are not nearly so hidden. And also great news is they're much more often clearly marked. So we, uh, there was a um, voluntary standard that went into effect a long time ago, but even better has been um, some uh, uh, ra ratings by the in Insurance Institute for Highway Safety that's really urged them to go forward with these. And the best of them are labeled like this one is in the Buick Envision um, with the words top tether right on it. And not to mention it's dark with a white writing. So we don't always get exactly that, but this is uh, what we like to see and are fortunately seeing a lot more. There are still some tricky situations on the backs of seat backs. This is one example from the latch gallery where um, in this RAV4, you have, um, what I'm trying to show here is that you have to slide the seat forward because when the seat is pushed up against the back area cargo, the anchor itself is below the level of the floor. And so you can see that here when it's installed with the tether strap attached, uh, you don't see the hook because it's behind the, it's underneath the floor area. And if you slide the seat forward, then you do find a label there, uh, but you have to know to slide the seat forward um, to do that. Uh, a much newer example of this is a Honda Passport. And in that case, Similarly, you can't see the anchor itself when the seat is pushed up against the seat back, uh, but they have very helpfully added a label up above with a nice arrow saying, look down, <laughs> look downward. And so when you do and you slide the seat forward, you'll find the anchor there as well as a label. So uh, another label to tell you this, you found what you were looking for. And so here's an example from this vehicle in the latch gallery uh, and the owner's manual information here. And another thing to note about that is if you've slid the seat forward to hook it on, they're going to tell you, remember when you're done, slide it back. So that's a step you got to remember to do. So the other thing that is, uh, there are a few other things worth noting about uh, tether anchors today. And one is just that what, what I call decoys or things that could be mistaken for a tether anchor are still sometimes a concern. Uh, so in this car, it has exactly what I like, right? We have the white writing with a picture. Um, I don't think it says tether anchor. And we know that people don't always recognize that this has to do, this is a car seat and a child thing, but uh, at least they do have this label here and the bar is really apparent. Uh, but you can see there are other pieces of hardware that look very much like it up above it and below. So, you know, it's understandable if a family um, uh, would go, hmm, well, these are basically anchors for accessories. So uh, cargo holders of some sort. Um, and certainly you can't um, really fault, this is in a BMW, you can't really fault them for this because they have done great measures to make sure that this one is a little bigger and that it's marked. Uh, but what would concern me here and what you'd want to point out as a CPST is that if we don't go to the trunk and see that label and instead we're in the second row and we're just reaching over the top to hook it to, I could easily see someone grabbing and, and hooking it to this non-tether anchor here. Where's my cursor? Uh, here it is. Okay, right here instead of actually reaching down and getting to the right one. So we do still have to be kind of careful with that. Here's another example. This is one that I took this photo in a, a van I was actually riding in, and it's a the Ford Transit full size van. And uh, I noted as I was riding, oh, 
this has a tether anchor icon. And, and just one aside here, I do want to mention full size vans are uh, frequently going to be heavier than the latch requirements. So you can see this one does exceed 8,500 pounds, as I mentioned earlier. However, they can at their option include tether and or lower anchor hardware. And in this particular van, they did include the tether anchors. There were no lower anchors. Um, but check the latch manual because we try, we've made a big effort. Katrina really has worked hard because it gets really confusing with the different rows, but we've really worked hard to try to include as much information on voluntarily added latch uh, systems in these large vans. And it's important to know about because frequently you're hauling kids in these kinds of vans. So in this case for this tether anchor, what I wanted to point out is, well, I have my icon on the seat back. So where are my various places it could be? I could push around in this fabric here to try and find it, but in fact, it's down here on the leg, okay? So we have a couple pieces of hardware though. It is not this piece that looks pretty obvious when you're uh, sitting in the back seat or sitting on the seat you're installing on. It's actually up here on the upper leg, it, there are two squares punched out. I really, I literally had to lay down on the floor to even get this picture. So unless you're familiar with this, it might be hard to see. And, um, but it, this is an example of what it would look like. This is actually the leg in a school bus seat made by Safeguard. It does the same kind of thing where you've got the leg is a strong piece of metal. They've punched out two squares that leaves that bar in between, just like this one. And that is where you're to hook your tether anchor to. So when you see something like this, check the instructions, check the latch manual, check the owner's manual and see if that is the intended anchor, likely it is. The scary thing about this thing is, well, what is this other thing that people might be more inclined to hook to because uh, you know it looks like something that it could be hooked to. That in fact is the leg release hardware. So to make that mistake in this case, uh, back on that uh, on that other the BMW with the decoy, I think you know you don't want to do that because it might not be strong enough. You don't know; it depends on how strong, how much force in the crash. On this one, boy, you definitely do not want something in a crash pulling upward and releasing the seat. So you really got to be careful you're hooking to the right thing. Another thing we see a lot more in current vehicles in today's vehicles is the um, is cargo covers. They're just much more common um, in vehicles. And so whenever we're at the auto show, we are always checking the cargo cover to make sure that it's not interfering with a natural way to do our tethering. And we also ask for the latch manual. Is there anything that we you want to tell us about specific cars or about all the cars, in which case it might be at the very beginning in the what we call the bullet section to tell about cargo covers. So the heading would be about cargo covers. And in this case, in this 2021 Dodge Durango, we took our hardware and we found that the cargo cover itself is abutting the seat back. Well, we want our tether straps to go as straight a route as possible, right? But because this is abutting here, um, I could not even get the hook through, let alone this adjuster. And so, of course, we check, well, can I remove this cargo cover? And in this case of this particular vehicle, I'm sure it somehow does, but it is not something I would be able to do as just a consumer. I'd probably need to find, read the instruction, maybe use some tools. Uh, and so I didn't see an easy way to get around it. And what we want to avoid happening is having someone take their tether strap and go all the way around. Like, so say not use the cargo cover and wrap around. Not only does that make the cargo cover not usable, but it also is not the kind of routing that we want to do. We want a direct routing according to the instructions, not going wrapping around a cargo cover. So the third panel shows the solution to this. It's not rocket science, but it does take a moment to go, oh, here what we, here's what we do. We release that seat. This seat can be actually folded forward temporarily. And so we can hook it on. And so this is a case where you don't want to save that for last. You install the seat uh, after you've gotten the, the tether attached, fold the seat back, back up, install the seat, and then tighten the tether. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about tethering has to do with pickup trucks because we are, um, I've done presentations about pickup truck tethering. Uh, and I know you're all aware with of probably that we have both the router system and the direct system. So when it comes to router systems, we have something new in newer vehicles to talk about. Uh, this is a Chevy Silverado since 2021. 
um, they've had an update to the way they do theirs. So if you're familiar with truck tethering or even have seen pictures, Silverado or these Chevy and GMC trucks are the ones that had that big loop of rubber coated wire, right? So we saw that literally for two decades, we had that kind. Uh, those are gone now. So Chevy, uh, so uh, General Motors has redesigned it. I've also seen this in Ram trucks so that they're using what we might uh, be more familiar with even um, this little kind of router that is a webbing piece of webbing, a webbing loop, okay? And the, that there's something unusual about this one I wanna point out. And so follow along with me as I try to use, there's my thing. So notice that the router is over here to the left of the head restraint. Okay. So that's not where we're used to seeing it, right? We're used to seeing it in the middle of the posts. Okay. So what you're to do here is you're still supposed to go through the middle of the posts. And so here I've done that. And now I'm going to go to the left. Now, this is the, by the way, to orient you, I'm sorry, this is the outboard behind the passenger seat. So where I ultimately want to go with this is over to the, uh, to the tether anchor in the center. But I'm gonna to go toward the window first where the router is, loop it through there. And as you can see on the right-hand panel, I've got it looped there. So it's going through the, um, between the posts and then through the router. And then I take a turn back toward the center and I hook it onto the tether anchor. So this is important. What you have now is your loop is starting here. Okay, outside of the center of the post. And now when I go through it and, and strain and get it tightened up where it's hooked, the loop end is here in the center. So rather than the start being here and the loop end being out here, we have to where the, the loop end is in the middle. And the thing that's important about this is now we don't have any potential pressure being placed from a crash force on the head restraint post. So that is something that has come to the foreground in the last few years is this attention to the fact that, oh, we really never intended for this post to be taking crash force weight from a tether. So we want to avoid it hooking onto that. And so this is a rather clever way of making that work out. You just need to know to make sure you come through the opening over to it and then move over to the anchor. And on the anchor side of things, again, that's an update. Notice that, and I'm sorry, this is front one coming from the behind driver's side, but notice that the anchor, and here's the one for that other person, is a big hard piece of metal with an opening. So rather than a loop or something flexible, we've got a, a really solid place that you're hooking it onto. And I can see it here more clearly because I have removed the head restraint, which does help in doing this procedure. Um, and you'll note that I'm going behind the box for the seat belt. Uh, but I think that's going to make it a much easier to use system. I mean, it's still going to be a tight space. It's still a pickup truck, right? You still have to some challenges, but um, it's it's um, when you see these, it, you'll I hope you'll find that they are a little easier not only to get um, hooked up to also to make tighter, and then ultimately in a crash, they're going to work better. Okay, moving on to seat belts. Okay, so seat belts have really changed over the years because we used to grapple in child passenger safety with challenges having to do with very long webbing stocks, floppy things we had to talk about twisting a lot. But have you noticed that those are not really around so much nearly as as they, much as they were. What we see so much more now is a very, very low um, seatbelt buckle. Frequently, it's not even on webbing. Frequently, it's on a metal hinge or a metal wire. It might be a little bit flexible or it might be completely inflexible. Usually, they angle outward like this, and you might be able to move them up and down uh, a little bit, but they tend to not rotate all the way upward. And in this case, uh, you can see they're even flush with the seat cushions. So there's a couple things I want to just mention about that um, in general about these low ones. For one thing, when you see ones like in this Sienna that are flush to the ground, to the, I'm sorry, to the cushion, um, please be sure you pull hard on them because uh, pull upward on them because this might be a storage position and there actually might be a little bit of webbing down below. And the reason I note that for us as CPSTs is while when we buckle it up and pull to tighten, probably our straining effort to tighten up a belt would pull that webbing up. I mean, I hope it would. Um, 
but even then, you know, you'd want to know that, but booster seat use is what worries me the most. So this is the back, the third row of a minivan. A lot of times those booster users might be climbing in back there and they could buckle that belt up and snug up the belt and think it's just put on there just right. When actually there's some slack left over down below in the seat cushion. So you want to look out for that. The other thing I wanted to mention about this is this isn't a perfect example of one. This is as high as this will rotate up and it's a little bit forward. It's kind of hard to tell in the picture, but it's a bit forward of the of the bite and it won't rotate higher than this. And so where it comes into play for us as CPSTs when we're trying to install a, um, a seat, especially with a belt path that's close to the seat back, for instance, uh, most combination seats are going to be more flush to the seat back. We've all probably had this experience by now where the seatbelt goes through that belt path and it has to make a little teeny S curve to get into the buckle. Okay. So you got to do that. But the thing that happens then is that it kind of wads up the belt webbing around the latch plate at that point. And so if we do our normal thing next, where we pull the webbing out to switch it, and then we start tugging on the webbing to push it up, it's not going to tighten because there's too much friction uh, wadded up at the latch plate down uh, by this buckle. And so really you got to make sure that you're focusing first on the latch plate, pulling straight out from that opening in the latch plate so that you're getting the lap part snug and then helping feed the webbing back through. I've seen this many times. A lot of times you'll see it even in the back seat. It's kind of hard to see what is going on. I keep pulling tight and it won't tighten up. It's a lot of the time it's because we have to think about our slack starting at the first anchor point, moving through the retractor and getting up into the, I'm um, moving through the latch plate and going up to the retractor. You got to help it make that first step, especially when these buckles will not rotate upward for us so that the belt slides easily. It's kind of wadded up. Um, also, we see um, when there is some webbing on the belt, it's almost always only on the center seat belt. And so another thing they've come up with on these to make them store better so that they're not in the way if and they're kind of tidier uh, or out of the way is many vehicles have what we call a seat cushion cutout for that buckle. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. And it's kind of hard. It's, we found it kind of hard to, to, to show how deep some of these are, but we could see that when the seat cushion for our car seats, depending on the cutout or the design of the car seat itself and the footprint for that car seat, we could see where it could create some, some holes basically where it might not be uh, a good fit. And so we actually encountered this problem at one of my car seat checks. I took some pictures. I should have taken better ones, but you can see here in this vehicle that this seat belt um, is supposed to be um, stored in here, but I'm gonna use the seat belt for my car seat, right? So it's not gonna be in the hole filling it up. And even if it were, I don't wanna put my car seat on top of it either. But what happens here is you can see kind of, this is a Nuna Pippa with the original base. And so it had to have to fit right. It had to have that little rotating foot outward. And the technician came to me and said, every time we do this, it tilts to the side. Well, it's not surprising because there's a big hole it's falling down into. And it's just a, the matchup between that car seat with that particular seat cushion design. And so I checked with Nuna. Well, I fixed this using what I had planned to do, which was to cut a piece of my pool noodle to fit that shape set it in there and suddenly we don't have that hole because we don't want our car seats tilting to the sides. Okay, so after I did this, I did send a picture to Nuna to confirm that this is okay uh, as a solution and they said it was fine. So just be aware of those. Um, last thing about seat belts, I also want to note that um, they seem to be getting a little more clever on some of the designs. Um, I think we've all learned about the dynamic latch, locking latch plate, which really looks like it's a locking plate, but it's really still for locking for car seats, it's switchable. But the design of this latch plate uh, intention was to, once you've snugged it up uh, on an adult, that the forces of a crash won't redistribute the slack from the um, lap portion to the upper body, it will stay roughly the same at the moment of a crash. There are some designs that look, um, that you'll notice are looking more uh, unusual. It's not just a latch plate with a plain slit like we're used to. Uh, I am sure these have a little to do with that same idea of maintaining the um, proportions of the webbing, but just be aware that even when they have these unusual designs, you're still looking for the proper locking mechanism, which is in the retractor. 
All right, so we'll finish up by talking about some of those miscellaneous features. I have a couple that I mainly want to talk about, starting with this access to the third row. So modern vehicles, when they have a third row, they know they've responded to the public to say, look, we if we want to get into the back row, we have to have a way to get in there. So for years, we've had those handles that we could pop the handle or maybe two handles, or maybe there's a strap to pull and that center seat will tumble forward or move forward in some way to let you get into that third row. Well, modern, very modern cars now have what you can see here, which is uh, going to be buttons. Okay. And so these buttons, you don't have to figure out, well, which order of these handles and straps do I do? You just push the button and they do their thing. The, the issue for us as CPSTs is we're thinking about children and what do children do if they're in a third row and their toe can reach this button or they can, um, their arm can touch it and push it. I mean, really, those those of us, uh, some of us as adults would be very tempted to push a button that's right in front of our face as well. So you know that children are going to be tempted to do that. So um, at the auto show, Katrina and I kind of started noticing this was happening a lot. We saw this. And so we decided, well, we should start thinking about, um, you know, it's not really good to, for a child to do that when there's not a child on this seat on the second row seat. But what if there was a child on the second row seat? How would that affect them? And you might go, well, the weight of that person might make a difference. So thank you to Katrina. She might be laughing or maybe not. That <laughs> We tested that out and I, I actually push a button. They fly forward pretty hard. I hit her in the face one time. So sorry about that. Um, but we, you know, we tried to kind of seat her on there, like maybe pushing down enough weight that a car seat would do, or maybe a child in a booster. And what we started to notice was as much as this button does the same thing, both of these both these buttons shown here, this is a Lincoln Aviator, this is a Pathfinder, but we seem to have two basic approaches uh, and they are not exactly the same. This one over here on the left shows you, it's gonna slide the seat forward and it's gonna pop the seat back so it angles forward. Whereas this one on the Nissan Pathfinder doesn't say that. It's going to release the back legs of the, of the vehicle seat and topple it forward. Uh, probably in that same stand, stationary position, just toppled forward. So while they're doing the same thing, they're doing it in a different way. And I, we felt that this, there was some importance to that to child passenger safety, because what we found was if she was seated on the seat, it was pretty hard. I mean, and, and without putting the full adult weight, but just, you know, kind of putting some pressure down like a car seat or a child in a booster might, this was going to hold it in pretty well. Um, and maybe not pop. I mean, you still want to watch out for that. Um, whereas on this one, even a, a child in a booster seat, for, especially um, pushing that button would almost definitely release the seat back so that it's unlocked. And unless that child knew to push back hard and relock it, um, then you could be driving around very, very unsafe to have the seat back unlocked while the child is seated in a booster or a car seat. So um, it's just something to note. Um, they don't put the, la the owner's manuals with the cars at the auto show, but um, I don't believe, I think we did check some of these and there aren't always ways to turn off these systems. So it's something definitely to warn people about. The other thing that's new um, coming up in a lot of vehicles and newer vehicles are a couple different systems um, making alerts for rear seats. And so the first one uh, to note is called a rear, rear seat occupant alerts or reminders. So there's not really any official terminology for this. So that's why I say um, Consumer Reports calls them alerts. You might see other places call them reminders. But basically, that's the system that's going to alert a driver when an occupant is still in the vehicle. And this is going to help prevent with heat stroke, right? So sometimes we have occupant sensing systems that have um, a radar in the car, or other times they're end of trip reminders that might be like, for instance, door sequencing. So they're only going to let you know when they are in um, the, um, at the end of the trip. But I especially want to talk about the rear belt minders or Sometimes they're called reminders too. And this gets a little confusing. And the reason I want to point these both out to you is because frequently they're both called reminders. And we found people very confused about what's a rear belt minder and what's a rear seat occupant alert or reminder. So I just want to draw attention to the fact that there are two different kinds and we should be kind of keeping those straight in our mind. These rear belt minders, Consumer Reports calls them minders, uh, IAHS calls them reminders. Um, 
are systems that alert the driver regarding various aspects of rear seatbelt use. Okay, so um, in 2016, so well, for the front seat pad, driver and passenger, we've known this for years, right? We've, uh, we get that beep, beep, beep. We have a thing on the dash if we're not buckled up, but that doesn't happen for rear seat. That's not required in rear seats. And we haven't had them for forever. Um, but in 2016, NHTSA did put out a notice of proposed rulemaking saying it was considering doing this. They wanted to hear what the public thought about what types of reminders and reminders should be there. And so it is of, uh, of importance that, um, that they know that NHTSA might actually rule on that in the future. And so we're starting to see going forward some cars that actually have this. And so the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety actually added whether seatbelt reminders were available in cars. Um, so you can see on this page from IIHS.org, we have uh, their review of the 2023 Kia Carnival minivan. And if you go way down here to seatbelts and child restraints, um, we're gonna have rear seatbelt reminders uh, or seatbelt reminders in general, and they're going to be rated as well as, please note, latch. So if you're not aware of this, this has been in place for a long time now, but um, they're going to review the latch in the, in the vehicle. I kind of alluded to that earlier. That's where you find that. So you just go to the ratings and you go down to the bottom. And if they have done that vehicle, you'll, you'll find um, in many vehicles, they're going to get rated. Now over here to the right, if I click on the seatbelt reminder, um, this is all the SUVs that they've uh, rated for seatbelt reminders. Um, and so you can see there are quite a lot of them. And it's harder to see, I know, but um, some of them have, uh, then they're going to specify if they have one for the rear or not, because all of them have them for the front seat. And so that's the overall rating, but they're also going to identify whether they have them available for rear seats. And so you can see very few do. And then they're going to apply, if they have them, they're going to apply what they think is a good system and give them uh, a mark, uh, yes or no for that as well. Okay, and then um, to the right, you might be able to read this one better. This is going to be a similar thing for the minivan. So they've only looked at the four minivans on this. Um, uh, there are four mini, there are fewer of them, so you can see it bigger. But you can see the Sienna was the only one that had one at this at this point of the ratings. So I'll just finish up. I just want to note why this is helpful for us. Of course, it's rear seats, so we're interested in that because rear seats are where the kids ride. Um, but there are some other child passenger safety aspects to it. And I have to thank Katrina uh, because we actually, uh, a little over a week ago, we had a car seat check event where we actually saw these two scenarios that I wanna show you. One uh, is a Tesla. This happened to be a 2020, but this has been true in all these Teslas that they went ahead and put this rear the seatbelt reminder. So they just mentioned seatbelt reminders here. Uh, please note, this is in the seatbelt section. They don't put anything in the child passenger safety section, but this is a general thing that applies to both their front and back seats. And it's going to indicate on the dashboard whether the, the person, uh, whether the seat has the seat buckled or not. Um, and so this is kind of one of those things where if you put your you know, your, your briefcase is extra heavy today and you put it back there, it's going to detect it as a person and beep at you. Well, it's pretty slick right there on the um, touch screen for the dash, you can just turn it off, right? Okay, that's not something I'm worried about. Of course, I am worried about it because I hope you would put that down below or strap it in. You don't want your loose, loose briefcase being a projectile. But think about the latch installed car seat. This is why I would have hoped this might have made it to the child passenger safety section because we um, started looking at this a few years back when we got one of our first Teslas that we got it all installed at our car seat check. The parent was happy. They drove off and drove right back because as soon as they left, beep, we started to get a beep, beep, beep sound and it was on the dash. So they needed to learn that they needed to turn it off. But better yet would be to um, perhaps, if you don't want to have to do that for every single ride, uh, that's what we would like to find out. Is there a way to disable it or what would you like us to do? And so this is a page from the latch manual. Um, this is the beginning page of Tesla, which is our bullet section where we're going to have general information. Just want you to see here that we have asked the manufacturers if they have rear seatbelt reminders. If they do, then um, what kind are there? And this is going to mention there's something on the dash as well as an audible alert. If people, are, if someone that's seated is not buckled up, 
And we also want to ask them, though, because we, we do what we do, is there something we should be doing to prevent a false alarm from going off so they don't have to push it every time? Of course, we could let them know, hey, don't forget, you're going to need to turn this off, but maybe there's a better thing for them to do. So they did allow us to say, please note the shoulder belt entanglement bullet in the latch manual as a potential way to prevent a false alarm. Well, what is that? Well, for every manufacturer, we've asked them, what is your advice to prevent a child from getting a belt wrapped around their neck? So if they're installed using latch and there's a free seat belt, we don't want them playing with it. Do you have any advice for families on what they should do with that belt? And so you can see Tesla has already said you can buckle and lock the belt behind the car seat, or they don't mind if you put it through, if it's if a car seat using latch, you can um, put route it through the belt path and buckle it following the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, like I said, we had a couple cars that day. One's a 2023 Honda um, um, Sorry, I can't, is that a Civic or a Court? My, my screen is in front of it, but it's, it's a Honda Touring version. So it's the particular trim. I don't know if it's applying to others, but um, this one is a little different. So, you know, the, all of these might be slightly different. I just mainly want to note that this one isn't going to tell you everybody who gets in that they need to buckle up. What it's going to tell you is whether a belt that's buckled becomes unfastened during the drive. Also helpful information for families to know, right? We like to, to see that, but it's useful to note that that is different information. Also, <laughs> because I do the latch manual and because we care about our terminology. I also note over here on the instructions from the instructions page, while this test text refers to buckling a belt as fastening or unfastening, and it's going to tell you when it's unfastened or when it's fastened, the dashboard indicator uses the term latch or unlatched, which is misleading, right? If you're thinking of latch as our lower anchors, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about whether the seat belt is latched or unlatched. But this one is just going to be monitoring when they become unfastened. And so in the latch manual, we're going to have that section that says in some vehicles rolling in, if we're going to have that kind of a feature um, starting in model year 2022. So that's just something else uh, you can be looking at. It's only um, kind of a, a sideways uh, connected to latch, but we like to um, be thinking about what, what kinds of features in vehicles are going to be um, potentially affected by the use of latch or non-use of latch. And so uh, I think these are some additional helpful um, bits of information that people can find in the latch manual for our more modern vehicles. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to close on is just to give you a little heads up and I, Imagine many of you have seen this. I know I've included it in presentations before. Um, just to note that since 2021, a particular Han, uh, Mercedes Benz S Class, it has to be when the executive trim line, so expecting an adult executive riding in the back seat, but they have put in uh, an airbag in the back. So just to be crystal clear, this doesn't look all that strange to us until we realize that this airbag here. There it is. This airbag is emerging from the back of the front seat. That's not from the dashboard. So this is a rear seat passenger. And so, of course, you know, alert systems in our brain should go off if we start to imagine an airbag coming out at a child. So um, just know that this is in that one car. It's a very high end vehicle. You may not see it in that vehicle, but someday in the future, this could be something that is in more vehicles. So just be aware of it. Know that um, this is not your typical airbag that's a full panel that the air comes all into. It's more like a butterfly shape. And so it's going to fill in these panels and then the body um, can go into the middle. And so Mercedes wasn't nearly as concerned about it interacting with a car seat as maybe they would in a front seat, which of course is extremely concerning. However, they do say if it's a rear facing car seat here that you should um, use the entertainment system panel at the front and follow the instructions to disable it. So you can turn this off, but you have to do it purposely. It doesn't automatically sense that a car seat is here and turn off. You have to follow the instructions and get it turned off. So just be aware, this is um, when we're talking new vehicles, this is kind of cutting edge, newest kind of thing. There is no uh, requirement that this will be coming in all cars by any stretch, but it is something that's out there that is going to be more protective for an adult in the rear. And we just need to be keeping our eyes open for it and making sure that we're making it safe for children as well. 
Uh, and I mentioned consumer reports. They're going to be keeping an eye on these things for us now because they have instituted their new rear seat safety score. And so uh, I definitely refer to that at um, consumer reports. You can see the YouTube uh, link there for a video on the launch that describes why they're doing it, how they're doing it, where to find information on it. And you can see here that it's going to rate the vehicle based on both child safety aspects, including those rear occupant alerts, as well as occupant protection for all passengers, uh, and including those rear belt minders, as well as head restraints. Um, so that is a super new addition that came out just, um, I think it came out late 2021. So we have uh, just a couple years of information on it, but um, helpful to, to have consumer reports considering rear seat safety and rating it uh, for uh, how well it works. Okay, so this is my final slide just to make sure that I give you my contact information because at Safe Ride News, we are always interested in the helpful information you can bring to us, as well as your questions, of course. So please reach out to us if you have any questions. And so for today, I know Claudia and Tammy have been looking at the chat and the questions. Is there anything I can answer? And I have Katrina also with me if she can answer something. Uh, yes, we have a couple questions in the um, Q&A box. The first question is, can you address the fact that most GMC cars don't have middle head restraints? Um, have they been approached about this? This is a crazy, in this day and age, many of these cars, such as the Escalade, are often used for large families or groups. Yeah. Um, so I can't, of course, speak for, for GM. Um, what I do know is um, head restraints aren't actually required in uh, the, they have to meet the 202 standard. Uh, I believe it's, that's the one for the head restraint when they exist, but they're not required to be there. As you noted, most vehicles have them, and I will add that frequently they slide so far down that they're flush with the seat when they're in the center. So always check and see if there's a seam that might slide up in use. In but um, our experience um, is has been that GM and um, Fiat Chrysler, the Chryslers and Rams, would be the most only ones that tend not to have a center one these days. Um, I believe it might likely have to do with the fact that they don't they don't think there's that many rear passengers and they're going to value visibility more um although like i just mentioned some center head restraints can be slid down so far that it's not really blocking anyone's view when in when they're not in use so um i i'm sure that uh consumer reports and dr thomas are looking at that as a point that they will rate is there anything I missed on that, Katrina? <laughs> okay. So other questions? I guess we're running yes. out of time. Any other questions? Um, I'm sorry. Regarding the waterfall or Tootsie Roll Bites, have you noticed that people tend to slouch more or kids may not do as well in these with safety belt fit tests? Oh, it's so funny. I, I think I know who asked that question because I just got it in an email. So um, I haven't noticed... Um, but I don't know that that's been tested. I think that would be a great thing for C chips to look at. Um, and, and I think they may have already actually done some looking at fit. Um, I usually those little Tootsie Rolls are not so prominent that they're going to slouch a child too far forward, but they could move a booster seat forward of the bite a bit if they, you know, with a car seat, we would stick it up on top of there usually. They're usually shallow enough that you would. I mean, it depends on the footprint of the car seat, right? You don't have to shove it up against if it naturally sits a front in front of it. But if it if it's a design that wants to go right into the bite, often we will stick it up on top there and press down and we tighten it in. But when it's a booster seat, sometimes I think it probably could move them a little bit forward. And that would be something we definitely want to look out for. Um, I wonder also on the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety and UMTRI ratings of belt fit, if that actually has come into play. So I think that's a great question and something to be looking at, um, but I, I don't have, the question I got online was whether we saw actual crash injury um, from, from that. And the answer to that is I, I, I don't think we gather that data at this point, but I think it would be a very interesting thing to study. Thank you, Denise. Um, I think we are out of 
time for questions, but um, Miss um, Tammy would like to say a few words before we go. Great, thank you so much, Denise, and we'll definitely share the comments with you. Um, one that uh, maybe Katrina could help with. We had a couple people ask if they if we could uh, share the link to the YouTube video uh, uh, for Consumer Reports. And I'm sorry, I didn't grab it fast enough uh, to post it in the chat box. So maybe why I do closing announcements. So just a few closing announcements with you today. We hope that you are enjoying this National Child Passenger Safety Board webinar series. Uh, we just came off of a board meeting and we're having so much fun delivering them. Uh, we talked about a whole bunch of new uh, topics coming up so look for those to be scheduled soon uh, and you don't want to miss out on the june webinar airbags 201 presented by outgoing national child passenger safety chair uh, jennifer pelkey and you can visit cpsboard.org forward slash webinars to register next slide please and as a reminder, it is pediatric vehicular heat stroke prevention season. And I'm happy to announce that the Children in Hot Cars, which is a free online learning course, it's about 10 minutes in length, uh, was just updated. So if you've taken it in the past, I encourage you to take the updated version at Child Passenger Safety Learning Portal uh, at carseateducation.org. And it was re uh, released late last month. Spanish will be following later this summer. So while we'll, both versions will be updated uh, and you can contact training at cpsboard.org for more questions next slide or with questions. Next slide, please. And then finally, the National Child Passenger Safety Board will open their 2024 membership drive on May 31st, and we'll be seeking applications uh, for our field representative positions, which will start in May of 24 through May and go through May of 2027. And those positions are community engagement, injury prevention and healthcare, and public safety uh, law enforcement. And you can visit cpsboard.org forward slash board hyphen membership for more information. Last slide, please. So thank you again for attending. We will post a recording to carseateducation.org within one to two business days. Your proof of attendance will come in about 24 hours from a Zoom email. Um, and you must enter that information into your profile at cert.safekids.org in order to receive the CEU for recertification. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope you have a safe day. Thank you. I'm going to go back and grab if anybody is really wanting this. I'm going to, because I think I'm the only one who can copy off. Oops, maybe I can't. <laughs> Never mind. Maybe okay. if you just leave it up for a minute, and okay, they can sure search thing. it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording now. Thank you, everybody.